webinar started. So I went over a rehash of deep flip-flops since it seemed to be a little bit of uh, confusion. And yeah, there are SR latches, level sensitive SR latches. Then we worked and we created a D latch that worked with a clock. But what I really, really care about are these deep flip-flops. Specifically, only loads D value present at rising clock edge. And that's the most important thing because in digital circuits, we're pretty much going to build up all of our basic building blocks from D flip-flops. Now, we will almost exclusively use uh, rising edge D flip-flops, but you should be aware of the general concept of having a falling edge D flip-flop. So keep in mind, you know, as we covered here in, in the class, we really worry about D flip-flops. Well, why do we worry about them? Because when we put them together for things like this, a basic register. So imagine this. We have an input, an input, an input, an input, right? And synchronously, at the exact same time, it is going to store that information into D flip-flop 3, 2, 1, 0. And the output will be whatever is stored at that specific time. The reason being is that later on when we build some circuits, we will want to save all of this in a register. So it will be saved, and then some other part of the circuit, maybe an adder. You had uh, Dr. Mandrigar go over an adder, right? And I've gone over adders too, remember that? The A and the B numbers associated with the adder, and you put them together, and you could add them together. Well, you'll want to make sure that you latch the correct data for A, let's say, into this register, and then the correct data for B, and you'll have another register that's almost like that, and then maybe on the falling edge of the clock, you'll actually do the computation associated with the, uh, with the adding. And the reason why you might latch the data in on the rising edge and then add on the falling edge is what do you think? All right, to make sure that the data for A and B goes into the combinational part of the adder. Remember, an adder is combinational. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not being stored digitally. It's a bunch of ands and ors and nots and nors and nans and other types of gates. And what comes out the bottom of your adder is the, uh, the answer to your addition, and you want to make sure that you allow enough time to propagate through all those gates. So typically what happens is that um, the input register will be rising edge, and the output register all the way at the bottom of the uh, adder will be falling edge stored. And that way you're sure that um, all the, uh, all the adders or all the addition uh, work went all the way through. All right? So again, we're just looking at this concept called a register. And this is a four-bit register. So literally, you have four inputs, four outputs, and that over there, which is what? The clock, right? Yes. OK. <laughs> Oh, and here, here was an example we used for the, uh, the temperature display. Remember that um, with the example that we did, this was uh, from previously what we did. We have, uh, oh, it looks like five numbers, five digits that will allow us to store the temperature. Um, this must be Celsius because uh, with five bits, I think it's only going to allow you to record from 0 to 32. So timer pulses uh, 
uh, every hour. Mm. So we'll take a look at this. How would you do this? So we're going to take the temperature, and on C, it's going to put it in the present temperature, right? On C as well, it will take and move whatever was the present temperature and move it over to one hour ago. And whatever was one hour ago will then move over to two hours ago, and you'll use that with the clock. So as you have that information, first hour, 16 degrees Celsius. And then for the next clock, one hour later, it increases. Obviously, it's morning, or maybe it's morning. And then the hour after that, <coughs> it, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it will go up to uh, the, uh, um, everything will bubble over. And you'll do that with the rising edge of the clock. And so if you looked inside, well, it doesn't matter what this temperature is, it won't actually lock it in or clock it in until C has the rising edge. In other words, the rising edge of the clock will cause that data to come out and as an example, 18 will be uh, the output from these set of registers. Now notice I, I'm putting 18 here in um, um, just decimal right now. If I were to do this correctly in binary, it would be what? One, zero, zero, one, zero. Would you agree with that? So this would be RA is considered a bus, right? You've probably seen all of this in your VHDL code, haven't you? Yes? Kind of? Oh, man. <laughs> so on the next clock, then, the data is clocked into this register and will be available on the output. And so you'll see the 1, 0, 0, 1, 0 show up on that bus. And then the next time frame, one zero zero one zero will show up there. And then, you know, any more data that might be uh, clocked in, for example, every clock will advance it. Now notice, what sort of combinational logic do we have in this, uh, in this system? I don't see anything, do you? I don't see anything. Do you see anything? There may be inside of here, but it gets to a point that we're going to use a structure. In this case, the structure that we created is this D flip-flop. And remember, the D flip-flop had a latch in it, and the latch has this this type of uh, combinational logic inside of it, right? So this combinational logic is inside of here, plus we have a, uh, a clock right there, or a, uh, a not gate working with the clock. But we put this together and we make a larger structure called a D flip-flop, which then we use several D flip-flops to make a register from which we use several registers to make our design. So keep in mind that we are using a hierarchical method or what we call a, uh, uh, a divide and conquer. In other words, this is made up, in fact, this would be a good question. Based on what I just showed you, how many not gates, AND gates, and NOR gates are in this design way down deep. Give you a hint. Oop, there we go. 
Come on. So how many not gates, and gates, and nor gates were in that larger design? Turn to your neighbors and figure this out. All right, let's take a look at this. Well, I asked the question specifically, look at this design. How many not gates, and gates, and nor gates are there inside of here? So you have to look at each one of these. So would you agree the following? There are, uh, there are three registers, right? Where is, there it is. There are three registers, right? Would you agree that each one of those registers has five D flip-flops? Would you agree? Okay. So we have times five D flip-flops. I'm just going to do DFF, right? Sir? Didn't you just say how many of the gates are in one list? No, I asked how many are in this design. Well, then you'll be off a little. We'll see how far off you are. All right, so you got that so far, right? So how many total flip-flops do we have in this design? Fifteen, right? So let's go back to the previous page and look what look at what is inside of a flip-flop. A flip-flop has two latches and an extra uh, knot gate, right? So we have two latches. So if we just look at the whole deep flip-flop, how many nor gates do we have in, in this deep flip-flop? Four nors. How many ands? So we have four ands. And how many knots? Oh, I got one, two, and three. That's a good that's a good sign, right? Each latch has how many? One. However, there's an extra one here. Man, this is just so messy you probably can't even see it, can you? Do 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 there we go. That's a lot easier to read now, isn't it? So we have one for the whole flip flop and one for each latch, so a total of three. You agree with that? You all agree with that now, right? Okay, so let's go back down. In our design, it turned out that we had 50, 15 flip-flops. So the number of AND gates that we have is uh, 15 times 4. Same is going to be true with NOR. You know what? That makes it a lot easier. <laughs> so that's what I had. Yes, sir. Okay. You got that, right? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. You're kind, of, you're kind of like sad. Oh, you get it? Okay. You never know when something like this might show up on a quiz as well, too. <laughs> Any questions? Pardon me? Oh, yeah, this will go online. So, remember, we were also talking about finite state machines. And so let me, uh, let me continue with this discussion. We talked about the sequential design. Now, remember, we had talked about uh, combinational circuits, designing combinational circuits. We captured 
and we converted. And so, as one example, we went through uh, this, but we thought of a better way is to, if we wanted a output to be one for only three cycles, then we would sit here for a while and we came up with a little better idea. Oh, this is the one that had a really nasty uh, forwarding one. We really want to have this dependent on pushing a button. And so then we came up with this thought. When you press the button, and here's an example of the button. Hey, this looks just like what? D of a flip-flop, right? So on the rising edge of D, it uses it. In other words, this is the behavior we want. We want the output Q to be one for exactly three cycles if this is one. And here's the interesting thing. I could make this go even further. I could hold down the button and what would happen at this point? The way we have this design, it would still go back down to zero at the end of the count of three. One, two, three. Why is that? Because look at my finite state machine. My state diagram says if I am not pressing the button and there's a rising edge of the clock, I just stay here. However, if I am pressing the button on the rising edge of the clock, then I will move from this state to this state. Meaning that I'm going to now ignore the button for the next three rising edges of the clock. Because notice I don't have a B and clock. And so, you know, what we often do is we don't even talk about the clock because any transition is only going to happen on the rising edge of the clock. And so we could just simplify the drawing to look like this. And this would be called a synchronous finite state machine. And so the other name for this is a state machine. So a, or a state diagram. So again, I talked about, yeah, every state diagram has an initial state. So wherever this arrow is pointing to, that's your initial state. In this case, we talk about the transition. So here, on the rising edge, if B is equal to not zero, It'll just loop back to itself and stay there. If B is, is 1, logical 1, on the rising edge of the clock, clock, we will go from the off state to the on state. And then for each clock, it doesn't matter what the input is. It'll just go to the next state. Now let's look at another one. Did I cover this in the last class? Yes, no? So if you have a, uh, a car key with a tiny chip and uh, you want to press the button to unlock the door, then the identifier for the key will be sent. So let's say you press the button. This has a different thing, but it's a lot easier you press the button to say, hey door, unlock. And you will slowly send the, uh, the key sequence, right? So the key sequence will be 1101. One, one. Uh, some people said they had to leave early to get to a test, so that's all right. By the way, if you don't press, you just sit here in the wait state. And so, in this case, you're going to transmit 1101, one, one, 
And if it's not, if it's not acceptable, or this is just the sending of it, right? At the other side, which is reading this, it will be something uh, a little bit different. So this is another state machine, another example. Now, keep in mind that, you know, our input is A, our output is R. So what will happen if you hold down A? Well, in this case, you will go from sending in the Notice here you're, you're in the wait state. So on the rising edge of the clock, boy, that is a horrible uh, rising edge. Let's try this again. On the rising edge of the clock, you will start and you will move to this state where the output is 1. So here's the output for 1, 1, 0, 1. Now notice that the clock, even though you're still holding down the A key, you will go to this state and you will be there until the next rising edge right here. Yeah, right, oh my gosh. On the next rising edge, there we go where it will start in this state again. Okay? You got that. The main thing I want you to note here is that output, 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 rising edge, it's, it's going to the next state on the rising edge. The next state at this point is wait. But even though you're holding down the A key, you're actually transitioning from the K4 state to the wait state. And you will not examine the A button again until you have the rising edge of the clock again. So we had earlier the flight attendant call button. And in this case, we use an SR latch, but we use the D flip flop. And so the concept is the light will be off until you press the call button and the rising edge detects. So at this point, it doesn't matter what the cancel button is here. It will always go to the light on if the call button is not pressed, or is pressed, sorry. Now, it'll stay in this state if the uh, cancel button has not been pressed and the call has not been pressed, by the way, it, it'll stay in this state even if the call button is still pressed. It'll transfer out based on the cancel button being pressed and the call button not being pressed. So, hmm, it says we'll later convert to a circuit. I'd actually like to examine this. So look at this problem, and we want to see what's going to go on inside of here. So there's a combinational part, remember? And there is a sequential part. The combinational part is going to be driven by the D flip-flop. We only have one state we have to worry about. But we're going to feed that based on what we have here. By the way, it will also stay in this state. Actually, it'll, it'll look at this, it'll say um, cancel, not call, not that, right? So what I want you to do is to identify this. So what's inside? How many of you think you could figure this out? Not that many? Oh, come on, why not? Well, let's give a hint. We're going to look at it, what's inside. So what do we have? We have the sequential part. So 
So what is our sequential part? We did this already, two examples. We have an input, right? A clock. There'll be an output part, oops, which is Q. We have an input D. Where is this D input going to come from? So this is the combinational part. What's our inputs to the combinational part? Well, it's going to be call. It's going to be cancel. And it's going to be Q. Because we keep the light on if it's been previously pressed, even if call or cancel are not pressed, right? So what I want you to do is to design the system. Now, what's the steps to design it? Truth table. What's the other little tool that we have with the truth table? K-maps. So I've already told you what the sequential part is going to look like. What I want you to do is tell me what this combinational part is going to look like. Spend some time right now to do that. Turn to your neighbor and solve it. All right. Uh, we had a lot of questions on this, so I just want to do this quickly. Probably the most, uh, um, the most difficulty I think you, you guys are having is uh, uh, the concept of um, solving the combinational part of this problem, not the sequential part. So let's take a look at the, uh, the combinational part. And this is going to be uh, Vahid uh, slide 33, in which, uh, based on what we have here, we have a, uh, a call, a cancel, and a queue. And like any, and our output is going to be D, which we feed into our, uh, um, which we feed into our sequential part of the circuit. And so, as always, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So, for D, what do we see? If they're all zeros, zero, all right? If somewhere previously it was called but not canceled, you want to be 1. If it's canceled, well, obviously you want to stay zero. And if you cancel and it was previously one, you want to zero. So here's where it gets interesting. Call, well, anytime you press call, it's going to be one. Even if you press call and cancel at the same time. So then if we look at our, uh, our design and do a K-map, we have 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, keeping in mind that this is call and this is uh, cancel and Q. So what do we have here? Well, that is call or So it looks like it is not cancel Q, right? So that is uh, a simple design where we have a OR gate. That will be our D that we feed into the sequential part of the circuit. We're going to um, AND together. Cancel. This will be from call. And then this will come from Q. So this will be our 
our uh, combinational circuit. And as I showed in the slide, that combinational part of the circuit is going to be inside of here. So you attach these, uh, these, oh man, that does not look pretty. The uh, OR gate, and remember we had an AND gate here. We had uh, cancel, had to be an, oh man, this is just ugly as anything. There, that'll be nice and pretty on the, uh, this will be nice and pretty on your uh, uh, notes that I'm going to upload. All right? All right, with that, thank you very much.